South America, in the heart of Peru's highlands. The people here live off the land, trading in rice, maize, and local fruits. Germany is helping them to develop the region's agricultural structures, from planting right through to retailing the produce. In Tarapoto, the region's economic center, there's no real sign yet that Peru's economy is reviving. But even so, economists are forecasting growth of more than 6% in 2011. Vanessa Sanchez is an agronomist with the San Martin Regional Authorities. She and Lino Saavedra of the German Development Cooperation Agency are developing a biodiversity project for the region. She says cooperation with donor countries can more effectively tackle the poverty here. In future, Vanessa says, Peru should profit more from the global trade in organic products. This means making use of the country's own biodiversity. The Inca nut, Sancha Inchi, is to be grown and sold on a large scale. Germany's International Development Agency, the Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, or GIZ, and the Swiss agency SECO have been supporting this program in San Martin for years. Especially in the San Martin region, the international partners have been working hand in hand with the local authorities. This is mainly why our efforts have borne fruit. We've divided the region into different agricultural zones to find out which measures hold most promise for each area. An hour cross country. We're off to look at a Sancha Inchi project. We ride along with Carolina Sanchez from the Shanantina Company into the rainforest. The only way to reach the places where the oily nut grows is with an off-road vehicle. More than half a million euros have been invested in the commercialization of the Inca nut over the last two years. Earlier, this farmer says, they had to fetch the nuts from the forest and break them open one by one to get at the kernels. That brought in just enough to cover their own needs. Today, Carolina Sanchez and Michel Pazmoche, the CEO of Shanantina, are trying to grow and market Inca nuts on a large scale. They've taken trees from the jungle and planted them on 10 hectares, the rough equivalent of 14 soccer fields. This, says Carolina Sanchez, is a Sacha Inchi plantation. Here, the umbels, the future fruits, are already growing. And here, she says, are nuts ready for harvesting. And these aren't ripe yet. This plant is at home here in Amazonia, adds Misha Pazmonje. It flourishes between 500 and 2,000 meters. The big problem is that there hasn't been much rain recently. Even though it's just rained, he says, it was the first time in several days. The farmers working for this small company usually get about five tons of nuts a year from the fields. The trees have a high yield and the nuts can be harvested every three weeks, up to 15 times a year. For the agricultural workers, it means extra income for their families. Miguel Sinarahua tells us he's earned enough to help his son with money to build his own house. He sees the aid from Germany as the key to success. The German engineers see what we're planting here, and then they can go back home and tell people what sort of product we're growing. That's a bit of publicity for this great product. That helps us find new buyers and sell even more. The main thing here is to motivate the farmers to increase both output and quality. 
Are the farmers and producers succeeding in selling their produce with the help of the German experts? Next stop, an appointment nearly 2,000 kilometers north of Tarapoto, on past the gigantic snow-covered peaks of the Andes to Colombia. Bogota, a metropolis of 8 million people. Here the Deutsche Welle Academy is holding a workshop. Together with the University of Northern Colombia, it offers two-year basic and advanced training courses for journalists. Vanessa and Yesenia are two of the students. Colombia, they say, has been developing by leaps and bounds. And this can be most clearly seen here in Bogotá itself. The country's economy is expected to grow by 5% in 2011. But 40 years of conflict have left their mark on Colombia. The process of democratization the country embarked on several years ago hasn't yet taken root everywhere. That's one reason Vanessa and Yesenia have spent the last two years studying journalism with the Deutsche Welle Academy. We want to inform people. We tell their stories so that as many people as possible hear about them. That's how we address topics that normally never get a hearing, and that should bring about change in our society. The final session of the workshop. Deutsche Welle will be awarding a prize for the best documentary. The DW Academy has given most of the participants technical and journalistic training. Now the main thing they want to know is how to make a career in television in Colombia. A journalist from the state broadcaster knows how difficult it is to get reports to an audience, especially on local TV. She tells them it would be a good thing for them to build up a national network of contacts. In rural areas, it's still very difficult to express opinions freely, another legacy of decades of civil war. In future, Yesenia and her fellow journalists plan to use an Internet platform to make reports freely available to local broadcasters and exchange them among themselves. Jesani Herrera from the University of the North thinks it's a good idea. We have to come up with internal processes that will let us guarantee good quality. That way we can ensure the broadcasters get the best quality of journalism and disseminate reliable information. Poor financial and technical resources jeopardize many of these good intentions. But the main concern today is which of the contestants for the prize will come out the winner. The seminar instructor isn't letting on. Back in the German capital, Berlin, ways to improve development policies are on the agenda. It's up to Tom Pates to make them more efficient. The German development minister gave him the task of merging three state development agencies into one. The Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit, or Agency for International Cooperation. Too many duplicated structures, too much unnecessary expenditure, and too little effect were the main reasons for the reforms. Pates had to convince the 17,000 staff members of the German Development Service, DED, the Society for Technical Cooperation, GTZ, and Capacity Building International that the merger would help enhance the aid effort. But will it really help make aid to developing countries more effective and sustainable? Everyday operations will eventually show whether the move has paid off 
or not. We're facing a most difficult task, that of building acceptance of a single joint aim by everyone involved, in other words, by the employees of the three organizations. They not only have to want to work together, they also have to be able to do so. In Malawi, the decision is put to the test. Germany has been providing development aid there for the last 30 years. The main focus is on education, health and good governance. The new GIZ logo has already been put up at the headquarters. But Uta Borges, who has been running technical cooperation in Malawi for the past three years, says development work doesn't wait for structural reform. If I talk about a hope for increase in efficiency, then I mean that we will be able to coordinate our individual efforts better. In other words, that we can plan and steer the whole package in one go right from the start. There were sometimes difficulties there because of the different procedures in the different organizations. That will no longer be the case. Das wird in Zukunft nicht mehr der Fall sein. Over the last three decades, Germany has put nearly a billion euros into aid for Malawi. Yet the country is still one of the poorest in the world. Uta Borges knows the facts and figures, yet she still hopes for a breakthrough, especially in educational projects. Although education is compulsory in Malawi, less than 80% of children there attend school. In spite of official pressure, a lot here only seems to work with assistance from outside the country. Will it be possible to get more children into the classroom with German help? What's the success rate like? And are there enough teachers to do it? Back in Bogota, the prize giving is underway at Radio Television Colombia. Five of the 12 journalists taking part in the DW workshop have got into the final round. Yesenia Bayona is one of them. Her documentary tells the story of a girl whose mother was kidnapped by paramilitary forces. Yesenia spent nearly three months researching her story. Of course it's important to address such issues, not only locally, but internationally. The point is to tell the world that in my part of Colombia, there aren't just guerrillas, paramilitary forces and drug dealers, but other things as well. This training in journalism also opens a gateway to the world for us. Más de 3.000 desaparecidos, un número igual de muertos y una cifra indeterminada de desplazados dejó la incursión paramilitar en Casanare a mediados de los 90. Una máquina asesina que entró al departamento vestida de camuflado. Transcurrida más de una década, aún hay quienes todavía lloran a sus familiares porque no saben qué fue de ellos. Para nosotros es volver a vivir aquel momento desastroso. Other journalists who meet the German development minister Dirk Niebel that evening have had similar experiences in their own provinces. They want their documentaries to be seen, says Colombian journalist Robert Benitez. Of course it was worth it, but now after six workshops we should have the chance to show them. We're pleased to have been on board from the outset. And now we're hoping the reports we've submitted here are something Deutsche Welle would be interested in too. Whatever happens, one of the documentaries will win the DW Academy Award. The German delegation can watch them again on an internet platform. In the end, the jury felt none of the other productions were as well told and as moving as Yesenia Bayona's. She's visibly moved as she picks up her prize.
She's won a 14-day online seminar with the DW Academy. Yesenia tells the story of Yamila Peña, whose mother was kidnapped. It's a courageous act of free expression. In numerous interviews, she reconstructed the abduction and the daughter's search. Like Yamila Peña, many Colombians want justice. They look to the media and journalists such as Yesenia and her colleagues who want to express their opinions freely and without censorship. We hope this cooperation will continue. There are a lot of local broadcasters in this country who have very little chance to do anything. And there is a need to catch up and a real need for journalism training in this region. The DW Academy is planning further courses in Latin America. Yesenia Bayona's example should set a precedent. Back to Carolina and Michelle in Peru. The Inca nut kernels have to be painstakingly sorted by quality and size. The best are used for snacks, with or without salt. The rest go into the oil press. Before the global economic crisis, says Carolina Sanchez, some potential clients from Spain came to see them. They wanted to study the environmental and sustainability aspects of the Inca nuts. They were thinking about importing the nuts to Spain and using them in cosmetics, among other things. But in the end, nothing came of it. The potential clients disappeared. In the meantime, Carolina and Michelle have had another go at cracking the domestic market. The nuts have lots of uses, from cooking oil through cosmetics and medications to nut chocolate. Shanantina processes the nuts with self-made or adapted machines. A ton of Sacha Inchi yields 250 liters of pure oil but it has to be produced in sterile conditions for it to retain its quality. Demand in both Peru and Latin America is slowly starting to climb again. The oil is widely used in local cooking for salads and vegetables. Now, says laboratory assistant Sheila Rengifo, you can see what the oil looks like once it's been pressed out of the nuts. Then it has to settle. And after that it's filtered, yielding the pure product, free of any residue. The German-Peruvian Sacha Inchi project supports four producer associations in the region. In addition to Shanantina, another one produces oil. The makers, the local authorities and German development aid staff meet once a month. It's the job of the Gesellschaft für internationale Zusammenarbeit to advise the farmers and producers. Ivo Encomenderos wants improvements in the way farmers are taught planting methods. That's the only way, he says, to guarantee good quality. He suggests a workshop for the farmers. The main problem is keeping track of what everything costs. Michel Pazmonje knows it's once again down to the monthly meeting to find a solution. If it weren't for the cooperation with the Germans, this monthly round table wouldn't exist at all. They are the ones who got the authorities, the companies and the producers interested in our work. That's why we met, talked with one another and, in the end, worked out how to construct a rational product chain.
We head for the biggest supermarket on the main square in Tarapoto to see how their plans are working out. Carolina and Michelle often come here to check that their products are actually on the shelves. They are, but they don't seem to be selling much. The labels on their products are already getting old. Both of them realize that they've made a start, and that's about all. With help from the Germans and Swiss, they've got their products into the shops, but they still need to do some real marketing work. That's the next step, and the hardest too. They have to persuade consumers to actually buy their products. Felix Makoko from the GIZ is visiting an advanced teacher training course at a primary school just outside Malawi's capital, Lilongwe. With German help, the project aims to get children who stopped attending classes back into primary schools. To do that, the mediators, as they're called, go directly to the villages and teach as many as 50 children there English and math. There are more than 100 of these teacher training centers throughout the country. Week after week, they work on their lesson plans. Their motives are simple. They want to go to college and train to be primary school or specialist subject teachers. We fetch back the children who have broken off their schooling, says Lester Champisi. That gives them the chance to return to a normal primary school. The seminar director, Musa Black, says that in spite of their enthusiasm, a lot of the participants find it very hard to teach math and English in their native tongue. Most of the time, when we call them for the meetings, they come. When we meet like this, they contribute. That means they are prepared for their job. When we go to their respective training centers, we find them every day on duty, we do their respective jobs with all, the, all commitment they have, they are prepared. Sure. In the afternoon, we head off to a school in Chimoka. Without a driver who knows where he's going, it would be almost impossible to find the way. The lessons last three hours and take place in the children's own villages. The kids don't have far to go, and the family atmosphere is another reason a lot of them turn up to the lessons. A board of school governors is also part of the concept, but as Felix Makoko from the GIZ Educational Project in Malawi well knows, support from the foreign partners is vital. The cooperation is very good. It's very, very good. Uh, and it is assisting the nation because it's targeting those you know, issues that are pertinent to the country, like giving back education to children like this. And for the past 30 years, Germany, or through GTZ, have done a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of um, activities like this, helping people to achieve for themselves things that can last. Bester Majamand teaches for three hours every day in the village church. In spite of the heavy rain, most of his pupils have turned up. Majamand is one of the project's most experienced teachers. Only last month, another two children from his class went back into the normal school system. A small success, but an encouraging one too. For Germany and the international community, helping developing countries is more than an end unto itself. The aim of educational, agricultural and democratization projects is to help the recipient countries stand on their own two feet, something which the donors themselves will profit from. Sustainable development policies play an important role in ensuring peace, prosperity and environmental conservation for us all. Globalization seen not as a problem, but as an opportunity.